morning. It's nice to see all of you. Uh, I guess really I should say nice to imagine seeing all of you. And um, as we finish up our fourth month of Zooming, keep reminding yourself that we don't look half as bad in real life as we do in these little boxes. Many years ago, in what sometimes feels like my former life, I was hired to spend a few days photographing um, runaway teens in Hollywood, California. And Richard, if you're able to uh, drop those slides in, that would be great. And at the time, Hollywood was the number two destination for runaway teens. I think there was someplace in Florida that was the first one. Um, the kids were mostly between the ages of 12 and 19. They were mostly from broken homes and many of them had been abused, either sexually abused or physically abused. They came from really, really difficult homes. There wasn't a single kid I met who you know, had a happy life and just felt like, hey, I wanna go to Hollywood and see if I can make it in the movies. They were all escaping from something that was very painful. And I don't know um, if we can get the rest of the slides to drop in. If not, that's okay, I'll just keep going. So this young, young man, Dave, uh, when he was 14, his father shot him in the stomach at close range. And he had been on the streets pretty much since that time. He was a heroin addict. Um, very, very interesting young man, uh, super, super smart, and really able to um, join people together to listen to them. He was somebody who everybody gravitated to in that, uh, on the streets. Now being out on the streets with these kids at night was really risky for me as a woman, particularly as a woman who was carrying thousands of dollars worth of camera equipment on my person. There were several times when I felt very much afraid and often, not all the time, but often I felt very much out of my comfort zone. Like what on earth am I doing here on the streets of Hollywood, California with these runaway teenagers? Um, there was even a few nights where this is the squat where many of them slept, which was the Hollywood Boulevard and the 101 overpass. And I slept with them there for a few nights, if you can call it sleep. Um, in general, spending time with them and learning about who they were moved me very deeply, even though, there's, even though their lives were very different from mine. And I think my willingness to listen and to show kindness and compassion to them allowed them to trust me and allowed my fear to diminish. And what I learned over time is that when it came to the things that mattered, we actually had more in common than I would have imagined. So we in the United States find ourselves in a very interesting place right now. In my almost 60 years on the planet, I don't think that I remember any other season that's been so charged, so terrifying, so unpredictable, or as polarizing as where we find ourselves today. So we're in the middle of a global pandemic, an acrimonious, an acrimonious political scene, which is probably just gonna get worse leading up to the election an economic downturn, and a great deal of unrest as it connects to race issues. I've been a follower of Jesus for 40 years now, and I've always believed that the gospel should inform how I navigate every aspect of my life, and, and this season is no different. And in fact, I have actually felt more dependent on God's word and on the Holy Spirit's guidance during the past four months, maybe than any other time in the past 30 years. So I'd like to spend just the next little bit of time exploring how our faith can help us to actively love those who may not share our life experiences or our, or our opinions on any number of topics. And I'll be particularly focusing on politics, the pandemic and systemic racism, because why not hit all the big ones? Um, this is when, when we are encountering people who are different and who think differently and hold different core beliefs, that's when loving our neighbors gets hard. So let me just take one, you know, 10 seconds to pray for us during this time. God, settle my spirit and help me to listen to you. Help me to adjust and adapt. And I pray that you would give us all ears to hear whatever it is that you want us to hear. And as we're listening, Lord, bind us together in love. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first obvious point that I wanna make is that we're not all the same, right? There's internal and external differences, differences in experience and differences in how we think and how we process life. So let me just offer a few examples. 
um, a few external differences. If you compare me as a 20, I was in my mid 20s when I did this assignment, college educated white woman who um, had a real job, you know, I was making money at that time, um, to the kids in Los Angeles. I was not homeless, I was not living on the streets, I wasn't addicted, I wasn't marginalized. So at least on the outside, our lives were um, fundamentally different. Or if you consider the differences between men and women, right? Even just on the most basic level, men cannot bear or nurse babies. Very obvious point, it's not possible. Men have a higher level of certain hormones, which gives them more facial hair, more muscle mass. So there's the, the obvious differences, and then there's the more internal thought processing or belief differences, experiences in life that sometimes are harder um, to see, harder to um, understand perhaps. So politically, you know, do you align yourself more with the Republican Party or the Democratic Party? Are you liberal or are you conservative? Do you believe in big government or that federal government should back off? Um, and when it comes to politics, at least these days, it's gotten much more difficult to be a centrist. Then with regard to the pandemic, some people believe that it's a hoax and that wearing masks infringes on their rights. Others believe it's a plot of the United States and the um, Chinese government. And then there are those of us who have lost friends and family members um, who may have pre-existing conditions, who may be receiving cancer treatments, and we know it's not a hoax. We desperately want everybody to wear masks and we want other people to be thoughtful on behalf of others. And when you go to racism, which is obviously the most personal example here, um, there are people in the United States who refuse to see or acknowledge the devastating effects that systemic racism has had in our country and continues to have. They might even be offended by the Black Lives Matters movement in the same way that many white Southerners were critical of the social justice movement in the 60s. And then there are those of us whose lived experiences contradict every single one of those perspectives. There are people of color who suffer from the many systemic disadvantages that exist in our country, who don't have access to adequate health care, or whose children do not receive the same quality of education as children in white neighborhoods do. Any and all differences can cause tension relationally, and they can become barriers to love, especially when we're in close proximity with someone who holds the opposite perspective that we do. So there's very real differences. And it's important to note that some of these differences are God-given or God-ordained and therefore beautiful, and other differences are not. So regarding the former, humanity has many distinct flavors. If we're all made in God's image, which is what scripture teaches us, then both our external appearance and our individual internal wiring reveals some aspect of God. Regardless of our skin tone, our hair texture, the shape of our eyes, whether we like hip hop or classical music, we reflect God. And I think that that's really amazing because imagine how boring it would be if everybody looked or thought or spoke the same way. These God-given differences are beautiful, truly, and they can actually help us to understand God's enormity. Sometimes man-made systems can cause us to have very different life experiences. Here in the United States, we had approximately 250 years of legalized slavery. Slavery was instituted and defended by whites and resulted in a separate and very unequal experience for black people. And that's true long after slavery officially ended. And in fact, this broken system continues to oppress black people. Here's just one, one single example. And this is from a Pew Research study. In 2016, white families had a median net worth of $171,000 compared to $17,600 for black families. And that disparity can mostly be traced to income inequalities and unfair practices regarding the availability of mortgages. Similar inequalities can be seen in education and healthcare and housing and particularly in the criminal justice system. So given that the differences between us are real, how might we, how should we respond when we come face to face with someone who is externally different or who thinks or believes different from us? First, if what makes us different is God-given and God-ordained, we should honor and celebrate it. So we should honor and celebrate the differences between Koreans, Kenyans, and Scandinavians, between girls and boys, between poets and engineers. Diversity is meant to be life-giving and joyful because all of God's creation is good. Second, aim for empathy and compassion rather than judgment and apathy. I'll say that again. Aim for empathy and compassion rather than judgment and apathy. 
Sometimes our default is to back away from someone who's different and maybe even judge them as inferior as we're backpedaling. And that was definitely true for me when I first met the teens. It was easier for me to judge them, particularly as it pertains to their addictions, because if I judged them, then I could be better than them and I could stay detached and not really love them. If I could put them in a different category and diminish them, then I let myself off the hook. And those kind of responses, I think, are somewhat natural for us as human beings. However, they're by no means scriptural. We see again and again and again in Jesus's life how he chose compassion over judgment and empathy over apathy. And empathy is just the ability to feel what someone else is feeling. It's similar to compassion, but compassion typically compels us to action, where empathy is more of a feeling and a relating. So Jesus, I think, inarguably, is the most compassionate, empathetic human being ever to walk the face of the earth. And here's just one little example. When Jesus reached Mary and Martha's house after their brother Lazarus died, he didn't say, oh, you guys, get over it. What are you crying about? He wept with them, even though he knew that he was going to raise their brother from the dead. So the, the pain, Mary and Martha's pain, moved Jesus to tears, and then he was moved to action. Jesus' empathy and compassion for the poor, the marginalized, the ones who are frequently overlooked, provides a model for all of us. And he calls us to be like him in this regard. So we get a glimpse of what that might look like in the story of the Good Samaritan, which is found in Luke 10. Now, most of us are probably very familiar with the story, so it can, the tendency can be to sort of check out when we read scripture that's familiar. Um, it'll be on your screen or you can follow in your Bibles, but I really wanna encourage you to listen anew to this, so I keep losing my screen when the screen sharing happens. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. So Jesus told this story to a man who had asked him the question, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And you can just imagine him thinking like, well, how many people does this actually apply to? How many people do I really have to be that way with? And Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him up, and they left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road. He didn't just walk past, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. Then a temple assistant at least walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised, and that's the word that's used in the NLT, Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill run, runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. So I wanna take just a few minutes to focus on why the Samaritan did what he did. What gave him the impulse to cross the street, to give up his time, his money, maybe even his reputation on behalf of someone who in all likelihood would have left him by the side of the road had the situation been reversed. Here's a little backstory. For generations, the Jewish people loathed the Samaritans. Though some scholars think that the Samaritan people might actually have descended from the 12 tribes of Israel, the Samaritans no longer worshiped God as the Israelites did, nor did they observe the lifestyle codes like not eating pork, observing the Sabbath, etc. So where the followers of Yahweh resisted the influences of other nations, at least sometimes, um, particularly the Greeks, the Samaritans actually embraced them. And as a result, they were despised by the Jewish nation and avoided at all costs. So Jesus' story, where the Samaritan is the hero, is equal parts surprising and confrontive. And in Jesus' parable, the man who had been beaten was Jewish. So really, the priest and the temple assistant should have stopped. He was one of their own people. He was more like them than different from them. But they didn't either because they felt too important, they didn't care about their shared humanity, or they were busy. And as an aside, I might suggest that we all look up the Veggie Tales, Are You My Neighbor, after the service. 
um, though you'll have the I'm busy chorus in your head for days. Whatever the reason, the priest and the temple assistant determined that the wounded man by the side of the road was not their problem. They felt neither empathy nor compassion for him, and so they crossed to the other side of the road. But the Samaritan man did the opposite. He crossed the road to come toward or to come closer to the wounded man. And why did he do that? This is my conjecture, but I think his own experiences of being disregarded, of being overlooked, of being despised, allowed him to have compassion for this man. So rather than judging him or using the obvious differences that existed between them as an excuse to look away, his compassion and empathy moved him to care and undoubtedly he saved the man's life. Now remember, Jesus was telling this story to an expert in Jewish law who had more in common with the Jewish priest than with the Samaritan. So this parable, I think, deeply challenges our tendency to look away or to believe that we have the option of not caring about somebody who's different from us. In fact, nowhere in scripture, at least not that I can find, are we given permission to look away or to ignore those who are hurting, who are oppressed, or who lack power, even if they're different, and even if they don't vote the same way we do. And, you know, I'll be the first to admit this really challenges me in some seasons more than others. Um, I think I've really been struggling to love people who identify as Christians, but who dismiss or downplay the urgency for racial justice in our country. I feel angry and frustrated by the racist slams against Asians. I feel angry about the apathy toward the situation with children being separated from their families at the border. And, and I feel furious um, about the brutal violence that's being done to my black brothers and sisters. And to be honest with you, I don't hold charitable thoughts for folks who are not bothered by these realities. So maybe, maybe this sermon is just for me. But I would guess that many of us have some group or subgroup of people that we find it easier to judge and ignore than to really care for. And when that's the case, we need to confess our indifference and invite the Holy Spirit in to convict and to empower us to love. My third point is it's easier to walk in empathy and show compassion when we're humble. Of the three men in Jesus' story, it's the Samaritan who exhibits humility, who knows he's not better than the man in the ditch. When we're in relationship with someone who's different from us, humility is always a good thing. We should never pridefully assume that we're better than someone or that we know their story better than they do. If anybody had the right to be prideful, it was Jesus. He was God in human form after all. But Philippians 2, 6 to 8, which I think will be on your screen, um, tells us, that Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So humility should make us less judgmental and more curious and more caring. So rather than assuming I knew what brought those teens to Hollywood, I learned to ask them, tell me your story. What brought you here? Now, to be a good photojournalist, I needed to listen. That was part of my background and my training. And while I was listening, to not insert my opinions. I needed to observe them and not center myself, but center their story. Listening and being in the background, I think, are intuitive for me, which is probably part of why photojournalism is a good fit. Um, that said, even though it comes naturally, it's always hard to lean towards someone whose story is radically unfamiliar, whose story feels in some way threatening or reveals that we may need to change. Now, a few of you out there are probably photojournalists, but as it pertains to race, being humble and curious might mean asking our friends of color, what have the past few months been like for you? Have you been treated well? Have you ever felt afraid? Do you feel seen and do you feel valued even in the midst of our own community? And then we have to shut up and listen to simply learn from their experience. And when we listen well and honor each other's stories, it can be incredibly healing. And that's part of what we're hoping to do as a church this summer, to sit in the room together and listen to each other's stories. So as um, was mentioned earlier, Christopher and I will be doing a Zoom call a week from today at 7 p.m. And then the Yuns and Van Dunks will be hosting an event for people of color I think it's July 11th, if I got that wrong, maybe somebody can put it in the chat. 
And please do let us know if you plan to come because we'll have a little bit of homework for you. So quick recap, we choose to celebrate God-given differences. We choose empathy and compassion over judgment and apathy. We choose to be humble, curious listeners and learners. And my final point, we seek to become kind but fearless truth tellers who work to dismantle any and all man-made systems and policies that oppress or injure. I'll say that again. We seek to become kind but fearless truth tellers who work to dismantle any and all man-made systems or policies that oppress or injure. So being compassionate, empathetic, and humble do not preclude speaking the truth or fighting to end injustice. We don't have to be nice and we don't have to agree in order to love like Jesus is asking us to love. And as Christopher referenced, I think it was two weeks ago in his sermon, um, we, I feel like it's, it's our call as followers of Christ to speak up when others are living in a bubble of, unreal, of unreality or if they're speaking over lies. Now, this can get really tricky and really messy really fast because what's clearly and obviously truth, in my opinion, may be fake news for somebody else. Take COVID. I have autoimmune issues, which means I need to be much more careful than your average 59-year-old woman. We know people who feel social distancing is unnecessary and even that wearing masks is an infringement of their rights. And I admit that my impulse when I hear that is to say, since when is your freedom more important than someone else's life? And furthermore, how do you justify that biblically? That's easier for me than leaning in and saying, help me understand how you landed there and trying to understand their perspective. I don't wanna understand their perspective. I just want them to change their mind. And I confess that is not very charitable. So I'm working on that in this season. But Christopher and I are also trying to find the balance of listening so that we can understand and care for our neighbors and contending for the truth because those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. So as it pertains to COVID, that might mean presenting statistics which inarguably demonstrate that social distancing and mask wearing significantly shows, slows the spread of the virus. We have been gently but firmly contradicting false information and then holding our ground which means that sometimes we've had to establish boundaries which feel really awkward. Like, you know, no, I can't come to your party because you don't think we should be wearing masks and it's not worth the risk to me. As it pertains to race, it might mean that as a white person, we step up when our cousin or our coworker says something inappropriate and we explain why the comment was not acceptable and why we won't tolerate that kind of behavior or when our place of employment, which champions racial equality on the outside or in their annual report, but then promotes yet another white manager, we schedule a conversation with HR and challenge the choice to overlook our black, Asian, or Native American or Latino coworkers who actually deserve to get the job. These moments are never fun, but fun isn't the objective. Justice and truth are the objectives. So what I'm essentially talking about is taking risks on behalf of others, being willing to jeopardize our status and sometimes our relationships so that we can advocate for our brothers and sisters. Doing so is akin to crossing the street and becoming the Good Samaritan. Not doing so, I would argue, is antithetical to our faith. After that first week I spent with the runaway teenagers, I was so moved by their stories, so moved by... Um, their pain and their resilience, that I ended up going back to Hollywood about a dozen times over the next three years so that I could get to know them better and continue documenting their lives. And nobody was paying, paying me for that, it was just on my own initiative. During those years, I had to make conscious choices again and again to cross the street and to come closer to them so that I could be a good neighbor. We really can't be good neighbors from a distance. The experiences I had with them not only changed my perspective about who they were and the whys of their choices, but it also changed me. It enlarged my capacity to love somebody who was fundamentally, or it seemed, fundamentally different. I'm hoping that we at Antioch Waltham will have many experiences like this in the coming months. In the two short years that Christopher and I have been part of this church, we have seen you be good neighbors again and again and again. We've seen you lean toward rather than away people, away from people. We've seen you exhibit humility. We've seen you cross the road to love and serve your neighbor. I think that this is really part of your DNA. And so I want to end with this very specific challenge. 
I truly believe that the Lord is offering us um, as a country, I, I, I believe that as a country and as individual communities, to partner with him to bring an end to systemic racism. I don't think that this is naivete. I think we're in a holy moment. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King, there's a fierce urgency of now. Jesus ends the parable that we read a few minutes ago this way. Now, which of these three, the priest, the temple assistant, or the Samaritan, would you say was a neighbor to the man who, attacked, who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So Antioch Waltham, let's go and do the same. Let me pray for us. Father, when the differences between us become barriers, give us your heart so that we can transcend the barriers. And Father, I ask that you would give us all compassion and empathy and humility that we need to cross the street and to love others who are not like us. Give us courage married with grace and mercy so that we can be truth tellers. Help us all to be good Samaritans who are willing to make sacrifices for those who are hurting. And God, convict us when we're tempted to look the other way. Convict us when we're tempted to cross the street. As we sang at the beginning, make us like you, Lord. Give us your heart. Give us the strength and persistence that we need to fight for justice all the days of our life. Amen. Thanks for listening. Thank you.